I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Latin America. I've been an expat for 10 years continuous, and before that, did a lot of planning and working on becoming an expat for about five years. So I have a lot of time in the expat space. I've lived in eight countries, which gives me a little bit of a unique perspective. And today I want to talk because Joseph MacGruber, 1920, asked the question, I don't want a storage unit unless it is a portable and I do not have to see it ever again except for delivery to my door in my new country. And I think perhaps to purchase, I'm thinking perhaps of purchasing my own shipping container so I can take my time unloading it. I can relate to that, not wanting to have a crew or trucks or not being able to work on it for more than a few hours at a time. Can I load a shipping container myself with a friend for help? And he asked some other questions. And this is a great thing to talk about because so many expats, when they are uh, first looking at becoming an expat, one of the main things they're thinking about is how do I move all of my stuff? So this is really important to talk about. Let's get to all that right after that bump. Let's start from the very beginning and say that one thing that is almost completely uniform is that every expat that I ever talked to has the exact same story. When they first thought about becoming an expat, they were sure that they wanted to ship a ton of their items down to their new location. And every expat I know that has successfully become an expat says that they regret ever thinking that and would never consider doing so in the future. But why is this? Let's talk about the fundamentals of what it is we're really picturing doing. Now keep in mind, we were not retired at the time. I had little kids who were going to school, so they needed all the things they needed to go to school. My wife was homeschooling them, so she needed all the things to teach them and to cook and, and to manage the house and to manage our expatting and all that, because I was busy working a full-time job, um, two actually full-time jobs to make ends meet working online. So I had to have computers and all kinds of things. They had to have school books and all kinds of things. Plus they were little, they needed toys and video games and, and everyone needs some amount of things. So all this was in our 11 suitcases. This is a full working family. And of course we pared things way down. A mistake we made at the time and later, we'll get to a little bit more of our details, but we put a ton of stuff into storage. Now everyone's got some nostalgic things they need to keep. I 100% understand and, and we have a lot, right? We have things that we promised our kids we would never get rid of uh, and they take up a bit of space and it just is what it is um, but uh, look carefully at that and see what you can get it down to but one of the things we regret is putting anything into storage really at all because back when we first started had we been 100 percent confident which we should have been we really knew what we wanted to do we should have had the confidence to say these are things we are never going to need again but we wanted to test the water so those those 11 suitcases worth of of life essentials that we used to move abroad ended up being the only things that we kept for a very long time by the time we ever did something where we could get back into the storage unit again the only thing we ever did was move our storage unit from new york to texas we never went into it and pulled things out of it ever again. During the move, we did get rid of a few things, but that was about it. We ended up getting a storage unit in Texas uh, and then keeping that and, and we packed it so full because we were so sure we needed things that we packed it to the point where we couldn't access it. Even when we visit family in Texas, we're not able to get into the storage unit and do anything with it. So it's completely wasted to us. So this has proven to us because we know we haven't gone in. We know we have no way to do so without taking everything apart. We've had our stuff in storage for 10 years. We don't need it. There's nothing that we've kept stored away for 10 years that we actually need. There's a few things we would like to have and there's many things that we've replaced, but there's nothing that we need. There's no reason to have kept any of that. And the $10,000 quite literally that we have spent on storage units, and we're super lucky because we've only had to spend money on them the last few years. Most of those years, the storage unit we had in New York was at my father's and he took care of all that. There was no cost involved. So to us, so that uh, that protected us from an additional $20,000 likely or equivalent of, of storage cost had we kept it all that time. Those are big numbers. Now, of course, different people do different things with their storage, but one thing that is very clear to us is that 100% of the stuff that we decided to put into storage was a mistake. Every single item that we said, we don't need right this moment, but we'll come back for, we didn't go back for. Not one thing did we end up going back for. So other than the nostalgic things, the, the child childhood memories that my kids just can't live without, it is all essentially thrown away except we are paying for it. And we have to put in a lot of effort, 
and a lot of money. And every expat that I talked to has a similar story. They all were convinced at the time that they became expats that they would want all kinds of things. And when they start living abroad, once they've put in the time and they have actually been somewhere for an amount of time, they say they don't want those things. And, and you learn there's a lot of reasons why this is true. So I want to talk about, like, one, it's important to understand that if you are going to want to bring a storage unit down, a shipping container, move a bunch of your household goods, you are the exception. There are exceptions. This isn't an impossible to make work out kind of thing. And there's certainly nothing wrong with it. But from a financial perspective, from a way you're looking at it perspective, it's almost certainly uh, being looked at incorrectly. And anyone who has not put a ton of thought into justifying why they would want to take it is certainly going to be making a really, really bad decision. So I want to talk about exactly why this is likely to be true. The first factor is new life versus old life. You're becoming an expat, you're moving to a new country, you can trust me on this, you're starting a new chapter of your life. It's essentially a completely new life. Even if you think you're going to be replicating your old life from whatever you did before into a new location, you're just going to copy the way that you behave and you're, you know, you did exactly this pattern, you ate this food, you wanted these things in your old world and you're going to move to a new one and you're just going to bring it all with you and do everything exactly the same. That is super unlikely likely to happen. There's nothing wrong with trying to do that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do that. And one or two people from time to time will actually have that happen to some degree at least. But by and large, when you have your old life, we'll just say you live in uh, Davenport, Iowa, and, and you like doing X activity on the weekends and during the week you watch this show and whatever. When you move to a new country, even if that new country shares weather and traffic patterns and cost of living and all kinds of things uh, with where you, uh, with where you came from in Davenport, the chances that so many factors of your new life are going to be close enough that they aren't going to alter what your life is like is practically impossible. Now, I live in Nicaragua, and I've lived in a lot of different countries, Spain and Italy and Greece and Romania and Ukraine and Panama. Every one dramatically affects every aspect of your life, in my experience. Uh, the way that you find entertainment in the evenings, the way that you like to do breakfast, how you like to work, how the air makes you wake up, what time you want to go to bed. Every little aspect of your life is influenced by the place that you live in and uh, in ways that are often quite unpredictable. Because of this, very few people end up living a new life that resembles their old one. Now, of course, maybe you're really into woodworking, and when you move to a new place, you want to continue woodworking. You don't want to give up a hobby, or maybe it's a career that you really enjoy or passionate about, or maybe you're super skilled at it and it's making so much money that you can't give it up. No problem. You can replicate isolated parts of your life without much of a problem. My children and I have always enjoyed playing video games together. It's been a huge part of our lives. And when we moved, one of the things we knew we didn't want to give up is our video game time together, which as soon as I'm done with this video, I'm going to go hang out with my kids and play video games. It's something that we have always done as part of our bonding time. It's important to us. So that we replicated. However, we made changes when we lived in more stationary locations or places where we had been for a long time. We accumulated video game machines. We had Xboxes and Playstations and gaming PCs and you name it. Things over time would build up and we'd have multiple ones around the house because it was practical or maybe not practical but easy, right? It's probably always bad to buy just way too many things. I wouldn't say that's exactly practical, but it was too close to being practical to not do it. When we moved to Nicaragua, it's harder to get the latest and greatest of things, and each additional item you bring in is a bit of a pain. You can certainly do it. Anything that's important to you, you can make happen, but in general, you're going to probably want to look at it a little bit differently. And so one of the ways that we look at it is we've shifted heavily towards PC gaming. It allowed us to have fewer devices to have to bring in, and PC games are cheaper to purchase outside of the United States than inside, whereas other types of games tend to hold their value. So we're getting a lot more mileage from our same dollars uh, by by moving to PC gaming. In, of course, when you live in the US, you still get more bang for the buck with PC games. But when you move uh, to Nicaragua, for example, you easily get two to a th 200 to 1000 percent more games. You get a, a uh, was it a 20 to 50% to discount 
discount. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to 90, there's up to 90% discount on games when you're purchasing them simply because they know you're in Nicaragua. So you're getting things at lower price when you're buying on PC uh, in many cases. So that has changed some of our pattern. We're getting things cheaper. So we find that PC gaming is more valuable. So we switched our pattern. We're not playing fewer games. We're playing them slightly differently on different hardware. We also discovered that owning multiple mid-range computers was more difficult than owning a single high-end computer. It just easier to deal with the logistics of it, right? In the same way, if we were to live here and move to the United States, for example, we'd find the opposite to be true. We'd say, ah, instead of having a high-end computer, it's easy to have many mid-range ones. Neither is good or bad. It's just that the, the availability of things, the cost of things, the ease of things shifts in different ways, and it makes different things make more or less sense. We also found that having small portable game units that are very heat resistant, very easy to move around in luggage and such, such as the Steam Deck, are more valuable here. So when we lived in the United States, we had one that we used, but now that's something that we buy regularly because they just make sense for us. It's a very convenient way to play a lot of games and is just as easy to do here as anywhere else, whereas other things may be a little bit more of a challenge. So little things like that, and these are very isolated examples, but they are perfect to show that we didn't really significantly change what we do, but how we do things changes because of the nature of we have a different uh, supply chain, we have a different cost, some things cost more, some things cost less, some things take longer to get, some things cost take less time to get, and, and it just balances out differently. Certain things can be hit with tariffs when they come into the country, whereas other things do not. Video games do not carry tariffs, but video games that are on disc, if we brought in uh, a video game collection on physical discs of some sort, we easily could end up with some kind of hassle or shipping costs. But buying them digitally does not. I understand most people just buy them digitally today. We're past that point. But at the time that we moved, it was not like that. It was still in a transition phase and we had to make decisions. Uh, so these are great examples how we've changed to adapt to, to just do what makes sense in the environment that we are in. So these kinds of decisions will impact every aspect of your life in most cases, whether it's your hobby, like you're doing woodworking, uh, or you want to cook, or you want to uh, just any number of things that you do, you're going to watch TV, everything's going to change a little bit. And in some cases, it's because of the reasons I mentioned, in others, it's because of laws or availability of products. And so you may adjust or have to make adjustments to get access to the things that you want, and so forth. I'm really into cameras. I mentioned this a lot on the show, and there's certainly very few cameras sold directly here in Nicaragua. So I have to deal with getting those cameras from the United States in most cases, and it's very easy to do, and there's simple workarounds, um, but it changes how I shop. I'm much more uh, uh, intentional when I'm shopping. I do a lot more research and put more time into getting the right thing, but it allows me to, because of my lower cost of living, I'm able to spend more. I have more buying power, and because of the way that shipping taxes uh, and state sales taxes work in the United States, we actually end up in many cases paying less to get items in Nicaragua, but they take longer. So we have to adjust a little bit of things, which is more important, paying more or getting it faster. Well, mostly I'd prefer paying less, but it varies by 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 person. Everybody has their own individual needs and, and, and priorities. Now, even of things that you're sure you're going to want to have, let's say you have a wonderful armchair, you love your armchair, and when you move to a new country, you're pretty sure you're still going to want an armchair. Absolutely, that makes sense. However, there are a lot of factors that you need to think about. The first is the armchair that you own today is used. It's not new. So its value is lower than if you were to buy a new one. So let's say you have a thousand dollar armchair, you've used it for a while, and now it's worth maybe $300. Does it make sense to pay to have that put into a, a shipping container, store it for some amount of time, put it on a ship and have it moved, unpack it somewhere? Of course, it'll take wear and tear, maybe some damage as things are being shipped. There's always the possibility that your items will be lost at sea. There's always the possibility that your stuff will be charged something at customs. We'll talk about all that. There's risks as you do this. There's wear and tear risks. There's loss risks, all kinds of things. Uh, there's the fees that you pay. So you end up paying extra for this chair when it finally arrives and you put it all together, how much less have you spent than simply replacing that armchair with something new 
from the place that you're moving to. Now, in some cases, maybe you have something that's very hard to replace. Maybe you have something that's very special. I have a few pieces of furniture that are from my wedding and I really don't want to replace them. I want those items. Those items are nostalgic to me. I actually have a spatula that is from my wedding. It's one of my wedding present spatulas. My wife and I have been together for 23 years. We don't want to not have that spatula. Now, it's easy to move with a spatula. So that's a weird example, but that's something that we've kept. We have two pieces of furniture that we've held onto for 23 years. And right now, one is in storage and one is at my cousin's house. He uses it in his video game room. So I feel good that it hasn't disappeared. It is still hanging out there. But in general, anything that was furniture, we didn't want to bring with us. We thought we did. There's a lot of furniture that we thought we wouldn't be able to get very easily here. We were mostly right. So we put it into storage and now we've paid outrageous amounts of money for it to not get here. And now we realize, one, much of it was ruined when we put it into storage and now it's too late. As it went into storage, we had no option. We were forced to, to keep moving uh, because we didn't have, you know, ways to dispose of it at the time or to make a good judgment call as to the damage. So there's a lot of damaged stuff in there that we're stuck storing until we're able to unload it. That's a unique situation. And now we know that it wouldn't have gotten here right away and we could have just replaced it when we needed to. And in fact, we did. Everything that we needed, we replaced. We also learned that in many cases, like the furniture that we have, now the ones we want to ship down actually are pretty useful here. They would work. Uh, but for the most part, the furniture that you have in like the United States, now Nicaragua may be an extreme example, but because the climate is so different in most cases, the stuff that we had in the United States would not work well here. It would be uh, uncomfortable, it would not be well suited to the, the environment, it would not be the materials that people would want to use. So in many cases, certainly not all, there is a uh, lack of value in bringing furniture that isn't designed for the environment you're moving to. Plus there's always the norm normal problem of if I'm moving something from my house in uh, the United States to my apartment or my house in a new place. Well, it has different rooms, it has different layout. What makes sense as furniture in one place may not make sense as furniture in the next because it's simply a different size house or size rooms or whatever. So in many cases, I would be paying all this money to bring furniture that then I'm not even happy that that's what I have because it's old, it's used, and it's not it's not based around the design of the place, the the color scheme, the the feng shui or whatever. It's I'm just shoehorning in old furniture because I didn't want to let it go. And that's not a great way to go. So a lot of our furniture would have gotten here and you just wouldn't be things that we would want to use. And in reality, it's probably cheaper to replace it here, especially in this case, as this is a country that makes a lot of furniture. So most of the furniture that we've bought here, we're able to buy high-end, really high-quality furniture at reasonable prices that we could not have gotten that furniture for in the United States. And we're able to get stuff that is specifically designed for the environment and the conditions and the how, and we're custom buying for the places that we live. So we're, we're actually saving money. Anything that we would have shipped down, we would have paid as much or more to have something that is ill-suited and used compared to something that's well-suited and new. Again, not everyone is going to have that same experience, but that is a pretty general experience that people have. Anything that they bring, they end up paying for again and then ending up with something that isn't a good fit for their new life at a price that doesn't make sense in their new life. Of course, it's normally affordable. It's just that you're overspending and, and you're spending more than necessary and getting less for it. So you end up in a bad position. Nearly everyone experiences this. They, we all, trust me, I went through the same thing. We all feel like the stuff that we already own is something we want to keep. And we don't want to replace it with something new, even if logically we can come up with the fact that it would probably save money and probably work much better for us. This is a known thing and I highly recommend this book for anybody who's willing to really rationally look at themselves and try to understand your own brain and its mistakes that it makes. It's called Predictably Irrational. It's one of the best things I've ever read. And it talks about the ways in which the human brain tricks itself and the way it does irrational things uh, and things to look out for. If you can really look at yourself and say, okay, I'm willing to accept I'm an irrational human that does stupid things from time to time. Here's ways to look for those things, identify them in myself. You have to be willing to accept the fact that you suck like everyone else. You can't go into it saying I'm superhuman. I'm the one logical human in the entire universe. And in doing so, if you're willing to say, look, I'm fragile like everyone else. How are other people fragile? It must be the same way that I am. There are so many things in there and it teaches a lot of these techniques. And one of them is learning that the things that you own, if you're given a car that you've owned for a number of years and another car that's worth 
basically the same value, maybe just a tiny bit more, definitely not less, you will feel really bad trading the card that you have for the one that you don't have. And we're not talking about maybe it's as good, we're talking about if we have proof that it's worth a little bit more, it still will make you feel bad and most people will avoid upgrading to the new car, not a huge upgrade, if it's, you know, if you're getting a Ferrari for your Toyota, of course we're all going to do it, but if it's a really close, just a small upgrade, most of us won't do it even though we know it's an upgrade, even though we're making more money, even though we know we're getting more from the deal, because what we have emotionally is more fulfilling than the thing we don't have. We place an inappropriately high value on things we already own versus things we don't own, and it's a mistake, and this leads us uh, to things like sunk cost fallacy, throwing good money after bad, and making bad financial decisions. In business we study these things. I work in a space where we have to deal with this every day and help businesses not make these mistakes, because in business you never let emotions do anything. But in personal lives, and when we're becoming expats, one of the things we often do is get driven by emotions, because we're emotional creatures as humans, and it, becoming an expat is an emotional experience. And moving to a new country is often done for a lot of emotional reasons. Very few of us move move to a new country just because the money says we should. Of course, that's fine, and a lot of us include that in the calculations, but most of what drives us to a new country is our emotions. Oh, I think this new country seems exciting, or it seems safe, or it seems like it's going to do some wonderful thing for me. Great, and that may prompt you to go, or maybe, oh, the place that I'm in is not fulfilling my needs emotionally, or I'm scared, or whatever, I need something better or different, I just need to get away from the people I'm used to. I need a fresh start. Any, any number of reasons. But those things are all emotional at the end of the day. Uh, except for the, and I'd like my money to go farther. Ooh, not everyone wants to do that. Some people go to places that cost more, but not the majority. The majority are looking for ways to save money as well. So if you were to simply say, okay, these two places cost almost the same, but this one is a little bit better. And if you made every single aspect of it just a little bit better, someone would, most people would still say, nah, I'll take the place that I've already been, because better isn't enough. I value what I have over improvement, unless that improvement is really significant. If it's significant enough, we're all going to make that leap, but most of us won't when it's close, and so we don't incrementally improve our lives because of this emotional uh, reaction. And this is super important when we start talking about this kind of thing, because the majority of why we ship things is because we don't want to let go of something that we can pretty easily, in most cases, demonstrate is a financial loss to hold on to, and logically not something that makes sense to hold on to. Now, if you break down every individual item that you have, chances are you can make an argument for just about all of it. All of those arguments are, are likely to be poor, very bad arguments, grasping at straws, desperately trying to keep things whether they make sense or not. Now, are there things that will make sense in your life to keep? Yes. Can you be really aggressive and, and maybe just keep a few things and really plant? You might, but be very careful. Once you're having that, I'm just going to get a storage unit, I'm going to ship things down. I'm gonna... It's likely you're going to make terrible decisions. I did, everyone I know did, everyone regrets it, and there are ways to fix that. So that's why I'm trying to help protect you guys from the same mistakes that I and everyone I know has made becoming expats. And that's one of the reasons why we have this channel and why I put in the effort to do this, because these are things we can help with, because these are tried and true things that, that are known to be problems and known to have ways to make it better in most cases. Now, there's always going to be the exception, but the chances that you are that exception is extremely low. And if you immediately jump to maybe I'm the exception, instead of saying, whoa, I, I, I can't likely be the exception, then you need to read predictably irrational, because that is a predictable irrational response. We almost all fall under not the exception, but everybody wants to be the exception. Everyone wants to prioritize things we already own. Everyone wants to feel like the exception. And we will irrationally drive to get to those places because they both make us feel good. A huge factor that a lot of people never think about is time. Now, in some cases, for example, Mexico. If you're looking at moving to Mexico, one, quite often your stuff is going to move over land, and it's relatively easy. So when we're thinking about moving to places like Mexico or Canada, it's pretty common to assume we're going to move a lot of our household goods along with everything else, because it's so easy to do and not very uh, expensive in the relative terms. Of course, people who are moving with a job, quite often their job is moving their stuff. I'm not sure why jobs do it quite this way. There's probably reasons uh, why they do this. Uh, but 
Um, it is a normal thing. So when you're thinking about moving with work and they're forcing you to move, often they just ship your stuff for you. They have deals and processes and all these things for that. So um, it, people get this mindset, but when you're moving on your own, generally this doesn't make sense. There's a lot of times where things like insurance and jobs and HR, they do things because they have to because of the way that they work. They have different requirements than you do as an individual. They may also be sending you part-time, all kinds of things. So it's, uh, it's important to look at this. Uh, so if you're moving to Mexico, one of the reasons they're a great example, one, is that they're super close and you can go over land, but also that in most cases, if you're going to move uh, to... Uh, Mexico, you generally work out your paperwork ahead of time. Mexico leans heavily towards pre-approval and, and lots of documentation before you move. Uh, other places, like Nicaragua, are very heavily another way. And so with Mexico, generally you're able to make the decision that you're going to send your stuff more or less at the same time that you go. In some cases, it may even go with you, right, all at once. Uh, whereas with Nicaragua, so Mexico's an extreme on one side, Nicaragua's the most extreme, as far as I know, on the other, that you generally move to the country, live here for years, potentially, and don't look at getting your residency, which is what allows you to bring your stuff down, possibly for quite some time. Some people do it in a number of months, some people do it in a number of years. Most people fall somewhere in the middle, just a year or two. But that's a long time to basically guarantee that you're going to go without your stuff. So that means you're going to be storing it. And by the time you get it, you're going to have replaced things that you need within the last who knows how long. And the amount of time that it'll take to get it is very much unknown. Now, most countries will fall somewhere in the middle. They won't be nearly as long as Nicaragua, but not as immediate as Mexico. Your mileage may vary. But for a lot of people, this is a major factor that they don't think about, that they will have to replace things that they need before they get it, making much of the stuff that they're moving moot. They'll already want furniture. They'll already want their kitchen gadgets replaced or whatever. They don't need to ship it down anymore. Uh, or they'll have to go long periods of time without it in the hopes of getting it. Now, it's also worth noting a lot of people end up losing everything, whether it's a problem with customs, uh, cost things, shippers that steal stuff. This is a real thing. There are entire shipping companies that just in ones that are often highly regarded by expats. Oh, I use them. They're great. You get lots of references. I know multiple people who have done this and had 100% of every possession that they had in the world stolen because the shipper was running scams. They got caught and they either dumped things at sea or it got captured by uh, a port or whatever. Plus, there's always the risk of pirates, storms, all kinds of things. So, does this happen to most people? Of course not. But it's a real risk that real people face when you're shipping everything you own and it's going overseas. And it, especially if you're going to do it multiple times, every time you're taking some amount of risks. Low, but real. And as an expat, it is something that expats, we know, the very few who have tried shipping, it's something that comes up a noticeable percentage of the time. Beyond all the timing and everything, the cost is simply a major factor. In most cases, bringing things into a country is quite expensive. Now, that could just be the shipping cost, it could be your storage cost, it could be your packing cost, and in some cases it'll also be tariffs and import costs, because you're importing, in many cases, a lot of household goods. Some people are just bringing an extra suitcase, and that's generally just fine. But when we're talking about shipping containers or a major uh, effort to, to bring household goods, sometimes even vehicles, this is an import. Now, some countries will say, oh, you're moving to the country. We're going to let you come in with a certain amount of household goods here in Nicaragua. You get quite a bit of household goods tax-free or nearly tax-free, uh, depending. But it's uh, there are limits. There's timing. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And for the most part, people don't take advantage of this because it's so costly to do. And the time delays, as I mentioned, make it impractical. Now, for us, we have uh, some amount of stuff that we've left in storage. We we are planning on this immense effort to go up and empty our storage unit, try to get it down to as few things as possible, just a few pallets, and use our tax incentive to ship what little bit we have into the country. We know that we are staying here for a very long time. This is one of the advantages to having taken so long in bringing it down, is that we are very confident that this is the place that we are. So making a, a shipment uh, to Nicaragua because we're going to include those those memory items. We're going to include those those kids' toys from when they're their childhoods. They are going to want to have those things when they are older to remember. Maybe if they have kids that they can play with them with their kids and stuff. Those are things that we promised them and we're going to bring down. But those are the kinds of things that we're bringing primarily. There's very few items uh, that matter in the storage unit. We're basically going to empty it out 
and give it all away or throw it away. Uh, and so our goal, our real problem is that we stored things that now have no value. At the time, we thought it was worth spending $20,000 to ship them to Nicaragua. Now we realize it's not worth $200 to ship them to Nicaragua. It's worth $200 to make us not pay for the storage unit anymore. I'd happily pay $200 to no longer have to pay $300 every month for a storage unit, but I can't do that. I have to get it all emptied out and put it somewhere. So I've created this immense headache for myself because that storage unit is in a place that now I have to go deal with. I realize some people have better processes. Mine is especially bad, but we learned a lot from it, and I'm hoping that you guys can, can gain some value uh, from this process, thinking through how much it cost, all the complications, the timing, all and, and whether it's suitable for your life and so forth to put it all into uh, that your decision matrix. Now the next big thing, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, when you're first becoming an expat, one of the things you're not 100% sure on is where you're going to want to live. For example, 80%, uh, we had a video about this maybe six months ago, 80% of Americans who moved to Costa Rica are going to leave within the first two years. One of the things that many of those 80% do is ship all their household goods into Costa Rica. Now that costs them a lot of money, and now they have all these things in Costa Rica that they've invested more into. Their sunk cost is higher. So that armchair that cost them $1,000, it's only worth $300. It's been banged up. It's only worth $200 now, but they've spent another $500 to ship it down. So they're in for $1,500. The thing's only worth $250. They're going to ship it again. Now they're going to have spent $2,000 on it. It's only going to be worth $250, maybe less, if they manage to get it to their next location. And now they have this, this millstone around their neck. Uh, they spent ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to get their household goods into their new country. What if they need to move on to another one? In some cases, people simply want to move on. It is a flexible thing. The way that we moved for our first many years, we jumped from location to location because we were learning. We were trying to figure out where we wanted to expat, and that's something we generally recommend for a lot of people. That putting in some time to to really explore the world and and find the right place for you. Don't just pick at random. Don't throw a dart at the dartboard, and don't just visit one place on vacation and say, ooh, this vacation, like we've, we've got videos on how vacationing can easily trick you into thinking that uh, uh, some place is perfect for you and, and what's good on vacation is not good for other things. There's all these skills that could go into finding the right country. And I'm not saying take 10 years to find the right country, but certainly consider spending some amount of time and a decent amount of research. And during that time, even if you only put in one year, maybe spend three months in four different countries, bounce around just a little bit, get a really good survey and say, okay, we've made some really serious decisions. We're pretty sure that in our next move, we're going to be our final move. Maybe we'll move around that country, right? You pick Colombia, maybe you get the wrong city, you'll move to another city. That's okay. If once you import your stuff, you can move things around inside the country, that's okay. That's not too expensive. That's not too hard. In most cases, any country that I know will be pretty easy. Even European countries, generally you can move around. Even the United States. That one gets pretty expensive, but still, um, yeah, it, it works pretty well. But when you're still deciding on a country, you really want to be careful because that even in that example, just one year, just a few places, it would be completely impractical to move all your items around with you. One, it would take a lot of time. In many cases, the shipping takes weeks or months. In some cases, it would take so many months that you could ship just before you move to a country, meaning you had to pack everything up, get rid of it before you left country number one, and it may not arrive in country number two until after you have moved to country number three. You could end up in some serious complications because you're trying to ship things so fast. I don't think anyone is actually going to try to do that. It's absurd. But if you did try to do that, those are the kinds of logistics you could run into as a problem. So that first year, however much time you're taking to do that initial evaluation to figure out where you should live permanently, you need to do so without all those goods. So you already have this time frame happening. Then once you move into that country, we generally say it's going to take you two to three years before you have a really good feeling that this is a country that you're 100% solid on. Oh, this is my country. Or maybe you're in a well, I like it. I could stay. I'll probably be here for a number of years or time to go. This just didn't work for me. I got to find the next place. And you're just researching it and getting ready for the next one. So it, that, that two to three year mark, pretty typically you're going to have a really good idea. Again, just like that first year, moving your stuff during that first year, very risky. Moving it during that next two to three years, not as risky, but still decently risky. Now, like for us, we put in uh, 10 years total of moving around with a five years of 
really heavy research, which included backpacking and actually going to a lot of countries. So, so I consider that pretty, pretty serious research. Then many years of living in several different countries, the country we ended up in, we returned to. So we had a lot of information about it. We put in a lot of research. We were really serious and we still waited a number of years and are not moving our things until we have lived here for four more years. Now we're willing to bring our things down and we understand that this is our home base and that we will still be traveling other places, but we've established that this is really seriously our home base and with a very high degree of reliability. We're also moving down to moving so little stuff that in theory we could pay to have it stored here indefinitely. For If we would never pay for the rest of our lives to store what we're moving down here, we could store here in Nicaragua for less than we've paid for the last three years of storage of more stuff in the United States because it's so impractical what we did. So that's a lot of protection right there. Also, most of the countries that we would seriously look at moving to, if we ever needed to, we have no in intention, are places we could drive to. And so we could take the things with us. The things would fit in a car almost certainly. So we've mitigated an amount of risk that completely changes uh, the situation compared to uh, that what most people are looking to do on an initial move. And even so, it's a little bit reckless, but we recognize that in one direction we have wasted so much money, we've put ourselves in a situation where we have to do something, and we have children that we promised we would move these things for them, and we are going to do so even if it's impractical, because it fulfills our obligations to them. If it was purely a what makes sense on a logical basis, we would just pay to have someone set the storage unit on fire and call it a, call it a loss and move on because uh, we need nothing from it. We know nothing that's in it anymore. We basically don't even remember what's in there. I have a couple, very few. I know like one thing of my kids' toys. I know one or two things of my own things that are in there. Everything else, I don't even know what's there. Every time we open it, just peering in a little bit, I'm like, oh, that thing, that thing. I don't need any of those things. I haven't needed them in so long. But that is that is our picture on on. Uh, moving uh, with your household goods. And it's just so unlikely that everything is going to come together to make it make sense for you. So many people do it and then end up regretting it, and even worse, regret it, and then they regret it again in the future when they realize that they need to move on for whatever reason, that their lifestyle has changed. They were they had kids when they first moved, now they're empty nesters, they want to live in a completely different country, or they want to live on a ship, or they want to just do something more flexible and realize that all their household goods are weighing them down and causing them to be limited yet again for no reason. Now it may be a minor point, but another thing that is worth mentioning is that a great number of people, when they become expats, they come to uh, their new country, they put in some time, and over time, yes, their lifestyles change, that is one thing, and those lifestyles changing often means that the things that they want to bring with or have with them uh, are going to be different, so that's one aspect. But another important one is that coming from countries such as the United States and Canada, there is a tendency towards being a part of a very strong consumer culture. And when you move to other places, now my channel is based in Latin America, so we're, we tend to lean that way, but if you're going to Latin America, to Southeast Asia, you're going to uh, Africa, any of those places you're going to have a really dramatic, and even going to Europe you'll have a less dramatic, but you will still have a shift away from consumer society. So this is a really big deal and something that uh, very few people are really familiar with before they make the move. And they don't even always identify what it is that's so different when they get to their new country. Uh, coming to a place like Nicaragua, the jump is so extreme that we pretty much always identify it. But going to, say, in Argentina, it's much softened. And so you'll probably feel it, you'll probably experience it, but you may not identify exactly what's going on. Because if you're in Argentina, it's still pretty easy to go shopping and people still own quite a large number of things. But they generally own a lot less than Americans. But if you're coming to Nicaragua, not only uh, do you generally own a lot less than Argentinians who own a lot less than Americans, but you also have very few places to go shopping. When I take my kids to the mall here in Nicaragua, they like to go to the mall, and we have a number of shops that we go check out, but there really isn't that much that they want to buy. Now, if they were looking for clothes, that would be more. There's pretty much, you can buy clothes anywhere in the world in basically uh, unlimited uh, quantities, but 
of just general shopping, we don't tend to go around in Nicaragua and just shop. And this is true nearly everywhere in the world. The idea that you are going to shop as entertainment, the idea that you will buy things as uh, just a fun thing to do, that you will collect things to demonstrate that you are able to own lots of things. These are not life patterns that exist commonly outside of North America for a lot of reasons. One is that North America just is a consumer society. It drives the GDP. It's very important for keeping the economy working the way that it does, but even Europe doesn't exist that way. All also, in North America, there's a tendency towards very large homes. When you have a really large home, well, you probably want to fill it with things where it feels very empty. So people have a tendency to buy lots of things just to make the house feel more full. Uh, and so the big houses encourage buying more things. The more things you buy, the more you need to keep having big houses. The two feed each other. Europe famously tends to have very small housing. So even if you did want to buy and had the opportunity to buy all the same things you could in North America, where would you put them? You couldn't. It would be a mess. You couldn't move in your house. You would look like a hoarder. But to an American, it would just be a normal amount of stuff for a house. So th these little patterns that are so different can really impact lifestyles. Nicaragua is much like Europe in the that houses tend to be quite small. People, if you're renting an apartment, it's probably not super big. People live outside. People go places. People prioritize experiences and travel and, and lifestyle over objects and things that they can own. Americans and Canadians have a tendency to say, well, oh sure, I could go experience that for an hour, but if I own this thing, I own it for, say, a lifetime, but most things don't last that long, but you get the idea. It's something that you own, and so it's easy to see the mentality that we all grow up with in North America that going out and spending money on life is throwing it away. It's ephemeral. It's gone when, when you've spent it. But if you have a thing, you get to keep it. Saying that to me immediately makes me feel like, wow, it's such a good investment the way that Americans do it. And this drives consumerism. But the reality is, is that most people, especially once you've lived outside of a consumer society, start to prioritize. Well, no, actually, the things that make memories and make me happy, those are the things that actually give me greater pleasure in life. And I want my money to generally go towards those, both because they make me happier, but also because it doesn't cause me to accumulate things, which then weigh me down because the accumulation of things, much like hoarding, actually brings a lot of negatives. For example, the desire to move those things to a new location. Suddenly those things, and we say this all the time, and everyone's used to this expression, right? You don't own those things, they own you. And that's almost true. I hate trite sayings because they're almost always stupid and generally try to drive home a point that you can't logically create without them, right? They're, they're an excuse to not think through things. So don't take it too far. But I do like that particular expression because in many cases it is true. Once you buy a trinket, now you have to decide that that trinket you've invested in, are you going to keep it? If so, are you going to pack it, display it, protect it, keep people from robbing you for it? Are you going to ship it to a new place? How are you going to keep it safe during transit? How are you going to verify that you have it when you get to the new place? Will you display it there? And will you keep doing this throughout your life? Is it always something you want to have? And do you want to always have to have a house large enough to put it in? Lots of little things like that add up over time. And so one individual item, of course, works fine. I have a very nice uh, fridge magnet that I got in Bolivia. It doesn't take any particular space to store. It goes on my fridge. If I move to a new place, I simply pull it off the fridge, put it into a box with everything else like that. One little box, move to the new place, stick it back on the fridge. I don't need a bigger house to store to display it because it goes on the fridge, right? So there are things that work out pretty well, and it's fine to own some things. No one wants to say you shouldn't buy things. Of course you should. But are they practical things that you'll actually use? Are they things that you're just buying to own things. And it's we're all tempted to do that, right? But uh, living now, again, Nicaragua is an extreme, but people that I talk to who have expatted around the world uh, tend to have the same uh, story to relate. Just like we all feel like we need to bring all of our things with us, we all regret any decision we made to bring all of our things with us. And we tend to all say that we ended up moving away from consumer-driven mentalities. And we all ended up up 
really not wanting to buy or to own and possess nearly as many things as we did when we started the process. Our, our way that we view objects that we own changes and we don't want to have so many. We want to have a certain number of things. We want to have things that make sense. I love having this really nice keyboard. This was a great investment. It makes me very happy every day. I need to type on something, so it might as well be a keyboard I really like. I need to get a new microphone. I'm about to buy one. I'm really looking forward to having a new microphone. I've done a ton of research. I know exactly which one makes sense for me. I hope that I get it right, and I'm going to invest carefully in one that I think is going to be perfect. I'm not going to just go out and shop real quickly. I'm not going to buy what's just available at the first place. I'm going to make sure it's the right mic. I'm going to make sure it is the right color of that mic. I'm going to make sure I'm getting exactly the model that I want, because that's what's going to serve me best. And I will be very happy with that purchase, and I will not have any problem keeping it over the long haul. Right? And if I did decide that it turned out not to be the right one for me, I can sell it easily or give it away and someone will find it very valuable because it's I've, I've chosen very well. I'm not buying something that is just, and I don't want to say that, that this makes you not buy disposable objects. Of course, it just makes you make better decisions, I think, and, and buy more intentionally, not just collect things and say, well, it's so cheap. I just, you know, it's fun to buy things, try new things. It makes you change. Not always is it good, but often it is. Anyway, I wanted to talk about consumerism and shipping because people had questions and it's so easy to get caught up in, I'm just going to ship things. Of course you're going to ship things. That's what you do, right? No. When you talk to expat experts, expert expats, generally the consensus, it is rare you would want to ship things. And when you do want to ship things, you want to reduce it far more than you would ever imagine, and be very careful realizing that shipping is generally a major commitment to the place that you're moving to, and you may very easily and quite accidentally make a fin financial e uh, decision that you don't realize that may tie you down and cause real limitations for yourself later in life, and that later in life may be just months or a couple years, not decades away. So be very careful with that. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, we've got two major choices. One is the Buy Me A Coffee link that's right above, and the other is that Join button that we have down below. The Join button is a membership. It is a monthly commitment to just $5. The Buy Me A Coffee could be any number of coffees, one, three, five, they're $5 each, and uh, all of the, the uh, donations make a massive difference to help pay for the cameras and the microphones and all the little things that we're talking about, and I do work really hard to keep those costs down. As I'm saying, we're not collecting objects here, but there are a lot of subscriptions and licensing and things that we need to do uh, to be able to do this show. So you guys make that financially possible. We don't make money here. We don't sell anything. We don't have any relocation services. I don't sell any shipping services, nothing like that. And there's some great shipping companies out there that actually provide some good information. And even they say, rarely do you want to ship things. When you do ship, ship with us. But generally don't, right? That's great advice. I feel really good about those companies saying that. And that's that's important, right? But we don't sell anything here. We don't have any revenue uh, except for what you guys provide and the itty bitty bit that, that YouTube gives you, which is really a silly thing. But thank you so much for watching the show. And of course, you can support us by going watching another episode and uh, just for those who have been watching. So yesterday we did have the live stream. We were hit by lightning. Everything's fine. During the live stream twice and that knocked out all of our equipment and it just disrupted the live stream, we decided it was a bad idea to try to keep going. While we were doing the live stream, I got scheduled. I have to go to Belize to work. Many of you know that um, I work in Belize part time. I have to get up there kind of an emergency. So by the time you're watching this, I'm already on my way to the airport. Uh, and so I'm doing my best to get episodes out. I am racing. I have to fly to Belize, to Panama, to Costa Rica, to Guatemala, and then over to Belize and then return uh, just a few days later. My week is absolutely crazy. My daughter is turning 16 next week, and then there's Thanksgiving. I have so much going on. Uh, I will be getting the show out every day, I hope, but I am working super hard to make it possible. It is a a serious, serious bit of work uh, to get everything done. So just be aware that is what's going on. I will be jumping through a number of countries very quickly. I will be struggling and offline for a number of days uh, starting on Friday evening. This is the episode for Friday. So now, today, right now, I'm off <laughs> trying to get to the airport so that I can uh, take a 6 a.m. flight out of Managua with a 10-hour layover in Panama and then an overnight layover in Guatemala. It's a lot, but I will see all of you tomorrow.